good day everyone i am going to discuss now on bengal renaissance so uh, which i started with the uh, idea of bhadralok and you came to know that the Bhadra, base of the bhadralok this bengal renaissance been happened so many any uh, people love to identify the 19th century of calcutta as a bengal renaissance so uh, and because there's so many educational things been happened so many literature been written uh, so many musical things been uh, identified and in scientifically jagadish chandra bosu uh, and others invented so many interesting things especially the radio things uh, so uh, uh, and ramon rai ravnath chakur uh, so many things uh, we found in 19th century because of the reform uh, of the education system and others so how we get all those things and what the contribution that time of of the british uh, uh, colony to develop all those things and why they develop these things one thing we have to have understand that uh, it was the very remote the india was very remote from the britain so is a far distance administration how they operate so there was very much necessary for them to learn language indian language and also to learn in the culture so that's why they develop so many institutions and one name is fort william so i am going to talk about all those things bengal renaissance refers largely to the social cultural psychological and intellectual changes in bengal during the 19th century as a result of contact between certain sympathetic uh, british officials and missionaries on the one hand and the hindu intelligentsia on other hand so here we, we found that the british officials and british uh, british uh, governments and also the missionaries the european missionaries funded so many things to develop here and hindu intelligentsia uh, also very much uh, curious in these things because uh, one thing uh, we have to uh, uh, think that the hindu intelligentsia first time they they found themselves that there is a good chance to get their own country because uh, before that it was ruled by the uh, muslim people 750 years uh, and um, after british but before that india didn't get their uh, their own country especially the hindu people so uh, it uh, it, uh, it was the opportunity for them to get their own country so in the intelligence also figure out that uh, that there is the, uh, politically that there is a good chance to get their own country so here in the intelligentsia also operate uh, based on those uh, those uh, politics the settings for the bengal renaissance was the colonial metropolis of calcutta so how was Cal calcutta at that time uh, in this photograph i think uh, you came to know that how the calcutta in 19th century and, and it is one of the biggest metropolitan town of, of that time and and in all of the asia uh, uh, it is uh, in, in in a true sense it was a, a metropolitan town uh, and you, you can find it is a so modernized town that time which uh, you won't find in uh, uh, within the asia and anywhere uh, in any countries a metropolitan town is like uh, calcutta so before 1830 earlier than any other asian city calcutta already had a school system using european methods of instruction and textbook so calcutta people already came to know that how the european method uh, how to learn learn uh, uh, education through european method and what type of textbook there is so already uh, calcutta uh, that time the bhadralok society already came to know on their own in on their own initiative the urban elite had founded hindu college so urban the bhadralok class also founded the hindu college that time the only european style institution of higher learning in asia so it's named after the hindu college and newspapers periodicals and books were being published regularly in english and bangla so the city had a public library in european style so it was amazing that in 19th century calcutta had already contained a public library which was established by the british 
government. And Calcutta also boasted a native intelligentsia conversant with events in Europe, aware of its own historical heritage and progressively alert about its own future in the modern world. So I already showed you this picture. The representative of British in India who were mainly responsible for these positive aspects of modernization were a group of accultured civil military and judicial officials and some missionaries historiographically identified as Orientalists. So who are the Orientalists? So if so, who were educated and who uh, uh, that time was very much progressive in British and European people and uh, who were not that much uh, aligned with the British uh, nationalism or European very much fond of uh, modernity, enlightenment, those things. So those people became a Orientalist through their works. They were neither nationalist nor imperialist in the late 19th century and uh, Victorian sense that the uh, Victorian sense of the nationalist or imperialist, not like that. On the, but they were the employer, were some of the missionaries uh, employer. On the contrary, if they were products of the 18th century world of rationalism, classicism, and enlightenment. In the beginning of our class, uh, of these uh, courses, in the beginning class, if you recall those things, I talk about enlightenment, So, which is happening in the 17th century. So uh, where is the uh, central position was the reasoning, scientism, uh, secularism, um, individualism, those things are developed that time. So, uh, so these Orientalist people were the product of this 18th century world. Uh, so they were very rationalized, classi classicism and enlightenment. Unlike later European serving in British India, they mustered at least one Indian language and used it as a vehicle for scholarly research. So who come here? Most of the cases, these Orientalist people try to learn you know, one native language. It could be Bangla, Hindi, Urdu, uh, Parshi, that time they learned. And, and they, uh, it was uh, helpful for them to understand scholarly the Indian uh, culture, politics, and other things. Many Orientalists, notably William Jones, H.T. Kulbrook, William Carey, H.S. Wilson, and James Princeton made significant contribution to the field of Indian philology, archaeology, and history. So I already talked in this class about the William Jones and his philology and how the Aryan uh, ideas develop based on these things. And this all are nowadays in the under of the linguistics. So this philology is developed from India from William Jones ideas. And after that, uh, the very important character is William Carey and H. H. Wilson. And William Carey is very important for uh, Bangla language. And uh, he developed a grammar book for the Bangla. And this is the first time someone developed this type of book. And moreover, these Orientalists did not ensconce, um, uh, ensconce themselves in clubs or build a Chinese wall of racial privilege to keep them inferior race, they ruled at a distance. So uh, most of the cases, the European and the Britishers came here uh, for to, to conduct their job and most of the times they spent their laser time in clubs and they made a huge gap uh, with the native people uh, uh, and they are very racial in the uh, things. But, uh, but this type of oriented is people who are Britishers and Europe, they were not like that. They didn't uh, spend that much uh, laser time in clubs or other things. And they always try to meet with the local people and local uh, elites and also local pundits. Uh, and they love to spend uh, 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 in their research works. On the contrary, the Orientalists form an enduring relation with 
members of the Bengali intelligentsia to whom they serve as a source for knowledge of the West and with whom they work to promote social and cultural change. It was the Orientalist Training Center for British Civil Servants in India known as the College of Fort William, which I already mentioned in the class in the beginning that Fort William, uh, uh, William is established this college because of, of to teach the British civil servant how to, un to understand the uh, Indian culture, Indian language and, uh, and other things. And it's established in Calcutta by Governor General Willis in 1800, which seems to offer the most perfect institutional setting for studying the result of British Indian contact and accommodation. The college was the first European created institution of higher learning in India to welcome Indians as faculty members and to encourage cultural exchange between Europeans and South Asians. By enlisting the support of qualified Orientalist scholars to improve its education program, this college also transformed the famed Asiatic Society, Calcutta and William Carey's Sirampur missionary missions into highly effective agencies for the revitalization of Indian culture. So in Calcutta, we found this Asiatic Society established by William Jones and William Carey's uh, Sirampur missionaries. Uh, and this two type of uh, organization developed uh, to revitalize of Indian culture. And between 1800 and 1830 in Calcutta, as a consequence of the Orientalist impact, the Bengali intellectual was a confused but optimistic individual striving to reconcile partially digested alien traits and unsatisfactory indigenous traditions. He established relationship with British civil servants, business man and missionaries both for profit and to use them as windows to the West. It was his good fortune that the distance between Britain and India was great and that the Orientalist with whom he associated had became Indianized. The Bengali view of the West during the sympathetic Orientalist period helped to establish good rapport between Europeans and Indians, offering hope for the future. It should be noted that the movement known as the Bengal Renaissance, regardless of the good relationships established between the British and Indians, and the accomplishment resulting from such interactions, the Bengali intellectuals of the early 1800s was insecure psychologically. The Renaissance vision was in its early stage often painful because of the contact and confrontation between two civilizations and the even newly discovered historical dimensions. The Orientalists imparted to him their evocation of an Indian golden age, while the Sirampur missionaries transmitted a Protestant concept of the European medieval period as a dark age, both inspired in the Bangali a belief in the perf uh, perfectibility of the whole humanity. On the other hand, the intelligentsia regarded them as the product of an exhausted culture and on the other as representative of a culture disrupted by negative historical circumstances but capable of revitalizations. So these things are, we have to understand properly that on the one hand the intelligentsia regarded them as a, the product of an exhausted culture and on the other as a representative of a culture disrupted 
by negative historical circumstances but capable of revitalization. There are four aspects of the Renaissance movement which the Bengali intelligentsia developed systematically throughout the 19th century. There is a four aspect. Uh, 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 is a, uh, uh, the uh, uh, intelligentsia figured out uh, uh, the recent intelligentsia. The first one, there was the modernization of Bengali language and the simultaneous birth of a new Bengali literature. So two things, uh, because before that, the Bengali literature mostly the, uh, the absent was prose was absent there, only poetry based things. Uh, and Bengali language, the modernized Bengali language to adopt the different word, different uh, phonetics. So these all are started from this time. And secondly, there was the rediscover of an identification with an Indian classical era hailed as a golden age, which placed South Asian civilization on a par with the grandeur of Greece and Rome. So this is the first time Indian people and Indian society figured out that their civilization is also classical, same as like Greek and Roman. So uh, it made them proud and they figured out in the world map that they have a very golden and very uh, richful they had. Thirdly, there was the Sirampur missionary interpretation of the Protestant Reformation, which Indians applied creatively to their own historical situation. So these Protestant uh, things that uh, in European cases, they divided at, uh, the history in the three era or uh, ancient uh, medieval and uh, modern era. Uh, so uh, in Protestant time, you know that the Protestant is developed uh, to protest the idea of, uh, of Catholic uh, uh, Christianity. So this group is developed at time. So, and this group also developed based on the bapt, uh, baptism. In Dhaka, you will get this type of churches. That is a Catholic church, Baptist, uh, Baptist church, and also you will get Protestant church. So Protestant are a group are a very reformist group. And you know that I discussed before 17th century, European uh, judiciary, and uh, most of the judiciary system is, is operated by the church and clergy people are the main people uh, to operate all those things and the judiciary operated based on the Bible, uh, Bible biblical way. So Protestant group also protests these things uh, along with the other, uh, other uh, philosophers at that time. So, uh, uh, that's why uh, uh, Protestants always uh, identify as a reformist group everywhere. In India, they also use these things. At that time, they also provided huge money through Sirampur missionary in Bengal uh, uh, at that time uh, to uh, produce their own ideas of history, culture, and other things. And finally, there was the secular view of in universal progress on which India's hope lay not in resurrecting the past, but in projecting the golden age into the future. So uh, it seeded the hope uh, in Indian people uh, to get the uh, freedom from the uh, British people also. So this is the uh, 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 for reason, reasoning in for Bengal Renaissance. And when the college of uh, Fort William hired the ba uh, Baptist missionary, William Carey in 1801 as head of the Bengali department, every available kind of financial, technological, human resources was put at his disposal. So call, college of Fort William, that time William Carey got the chance to be a head of the Bengali department. And you know that from the beginning of this college, 
uh, the Bengali department is developed and, uh, and the European people uh, try to learn Bengali language properly uh, and systematically. And that China use uh, amount of money, technological and other things been in applied through William Carey because not only the British government but also the Protestant missionary invested huge money there with an un unlimited budget and capital staff of Brahman Pandits, Carey found himself in a most enviable position. So William Carey uh, got unlimited budget and uh, he, uh, uh, yeah, uh, he hired so many Brahman Pandits uh, with him uh, to understand Bengali language and other things in detail. As a result, you will get the grammar books. I will show you later on. His dream of creating a cadre of cultural intermediaries. So uh, his dream was that to creating a cadre of cultural intermediaries who would disclose to him the secrets of indigenous culture while also being pursued to disseminate Christianity to their own countrymen seemed closer to realization. So that's why he appointed so many Brahman Pandits uh, and he started uh, to, to study uh, with them. Kerry's first textbook, as a result, we found that this one, Kerry's first textbook was the Bengali grammar completed in 1801. Uh, and uh, in the right, right hand side, you can uh, maybe you can, uh, you are able to see the uh, cover page of that, uh, that book is a grammar, Bengali language grammar. And this is the first grammar book ever uh, been published and generated. Uh, for Bangla language and it was uh, developed by the KD with the help of the so many uh, Brahman Pundits and other people and KD and it was uh, published in 1801. KD helped to edit a reader for the Bengali students entitled Kathapakathun or Dialogue. So KD uh, when Kiri started to edit this one, that time his process was uh, to, to, to dialogue with the Bengali student in William, uh, 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 William, uh, 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 Fort William College and other colleges also and other people also. This book is perhaps the first by European that did not concern itself with the Hindu high culture. So this book not only only accommodated the words which the elitist Hindu class uses. They incorporated the other classes, the lower classes, words and other things here. So for the first time, the idiomatic language manners and customs of merchants, fishermen, women, deliverers and other common folk were given the dignity of meanings and sympathetic observation. So all those observations put it here by Kerry. It would not be far, far fetched to call Kerry as a result of this book alone, India's first cultural anthropology. So this book is considered as the first cultural approach to publish, greatly influenced by his work was Ram Kamal Shen, the earliest known Renaissance scholar among the Bengali intelligentsia. So with the Kiri, this is the first time we came to know a native Indian uh, Bengali people, uh, people, his name is Ram Kamal Shen and is the earliest Renaissance scholar, uh, uh, he is identified as that manner and born in the Hugli village in 1790 as the son of a father who was proficient in Persian. So I told you before that in Mongol time and other time, Hindu are always uh, learned to, bound to learn Persian to, if they want to work in a government job or with the emperor office or other office. 
they need to know the Persian. So uh, we found here that uh, that uh, Ram Kamal's father also known Persian very well. Shen moved to Calcutta at the age of seven, and uh, while there learned English, Sanskrit, and Persian. So uh, Ram Kamal Shen moved to Calcutta at the age of seven, and he learned all those things. And it was Persian which most helped him establish his credential as an indigenous member of the Asiatic Society, Calcutta. So because of his, uh, uh, his Persian knowledge, Persian language knowledge, he got a membership in Asiatic Society. But during that time and after 100 years, we didn't find any Muslim uh, 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 pundits or Muslim Molog or anyone who ask a membership to the Asiatic society. He in interacted with the Orientalists and worked on their publications. Shane was especially friendly with H. S. Wilson and Wilson who helped promote the Bengali as an intellectual entrepreneur who left an state of 100,000 rupees when he died in 1844. So Shane was very fond of with H.S. Wilson and Wilson contributed a, a large uh, in Indian culture. Uh, it was Ram Kamul who published the first modern dictionary of the English and Bengali language in 1834. So that time we found that this is the first you can consider Ram Kamal's dictionary is the first English to Bangla dictionary which has been published in 1834. In the introduction to the second volume that year, Ram Kamal expressed sympathy for the generation of Engl Englishmen who had responded favorably to his own language and customs. He not only singled out Kerry as a selfless, devoted father of the new Bengali language, but predicted that the language would come to be the equal of any in the world. So Ram Kamal identified William Kerry as the new Bengali language, the father of the new Bengali language. And this language, uh, uh, he found it, it was it was the equal of any uh, of any in the world uh, language. Why Ram Kamal Shen correctly uh, foresaw a, a brilliant literary future for Bengali, we may never know. But that the literature in that language did undergo a renaissance, there can be of little doubt. Writers such as uh, Michael Madhusudan Dotto, 1824-73. to 73. One thing we came to, we have to have understand that if William Carey didn't uh, publish that grammar book, oh, that uh, Bangla language grammar book, uh, I think uh, it, it will be a, uh, it, it would be late to get a a good prose writer like Isha Chandra Vidyashagar, Michael Madhusudan, because he systematically developed a grammar book. That's why we got so many good writers that time. And uh, Michael Madhusudan Dotto and uh, is uh, 1824 to 73, and Rabindranath Tagore in 1861 to 1941 wrote beautifully in English, but that they also choose to express their literary genius creativity in Bengali certainly helped shape the renaissance of that literature. Dattas, Meghnadvath Kabbo and Tagore's Gitanjali, for example, were renaissance masterpiece in the manner the tradition was modernized. So these two were considered as a masterpiece. It is of no small importance that Chagor was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1930. One year after, he published an English translation of Gitanjali and the song offering. So 
because of that bangla language first time and till the end till there this is only one nobel prize we got in bangla language of all the orientalists seeking to reconstruct the ancient history of india none was more successful as a scholar than h is wilson so what did wilson in 1818 the president of the asiatic society supported wilson its secretary in new measure to enhance the effectiveness of institution as an agency for historical investigation so wilson is appointed especially for that historical in, uh, investigation and it can be said that the primary function of the society as historical and archaeological repository and headquarter for all india really began in 1818 so from his time it's really started to work in that manner what it was uh, the uh, 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 what it was the motto uh, uh, during the stop this time h is wilson close friend ramkamal shen was hired to co coordinate coordinate this activity one of wilson's most formidable task was to demythologize myth, de -myth uh, mythologize the legendary heroes of the hindu wilson as a leading indologist working in calcutta constantly reviewed the most recent acquired historical data and the various interpretation of the data in the preface of the sanskrit dictionary of 1819 for example he praised those who had rescued uh, ankara from mythology had transported him into a historical figure so he and he is the first time who published sanskrit dictionary in 1819 and wilson had already performed this difficult feat with kalidas in 1813 and after doing the same for shankar he hoped to demythologize and give historical substance to the sacred figure of buddha thanks to wilson and the orientalist buddha teased to the uh, conceived of solely as a god and became historicized as a human being with a life history in the manner of jesus christ so wilson first time demystifies those characters and uh, we found the buddha's uh, human life in that manner which is like jesus christ wilson worked few uh, fevers fevers on different project he drew great satisfaction discovering manuscript as he did in 1825 when he published his report of the rastarangini a history of kashmir to 1027 ad most of the cases we found uh, uh, h is wilson's work in kashmir rajasthan nepal that reason and it constituted the first orientalist in inspired regional history of india wilson also brought out a book on hindu drama in the classical period and a systematic history of ancient indian medicine and uh, you know that ancient indian medicine has a huge historical background and uh, and first time wilson figure out that history especially the ayurveda uh, and the uh, yunani by 1833 when wilson set sail for england he had himself brought to light or inspired in others to bring to light so many original historical disclosures that he might well be considered the father of classical indian historiography under wilson the first authentic histories of nepal orissa and rajasthan 
as well as Kashmir were written. It should be pointed out that with the exception of these regional studies, which do include the Hindu Middle Ages, Orientalist scholarship was largely focused on the pre-medieval classical past. This is probably the primary reason why Islamic scholarship was not pursued and why the Bengali scholars who were affiliated with the Asiatic society later in the century were for the most part Hindus. And when one considers the wealth of diversity and profoundity of what was rediscovered in ancient Indian science, philosophy, medicine, the arts and literature, so society and politics, one can understand why Hindus would be so immensely proud of their ancestral achievement and which they held at their own traditional heritage. If the Bengal Renaissance produced one outstanding progenitor who embedded the Orientalist contribution as effectively as he did linguistic and literary modernization and the effective defense of Hindu thesism against the double-edged challenge of Christianity and secularism, it would be Ram Mohan Rai. So Bengal Renaissance, Ram Mohan Rai is a very, very revolutionary and different character who always challenged the Christianity and also is very, uh, 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 very, uh, uh, about secularism, he is not that much clear about the uh, notion what the European uh, wants to establish in this here. And also he was very much critical for the Hinduism and Hindu dharma. Roy seems to have lived in Calcutta for the first time between 1797 and 1802. He came from a family with a vested interest in the old establishment under uh, uh, old establishment order, and his father, a small landowner of the traditional ruling class in Bengal, lost property in 1800. So his father was a small sized landowner. But he lost his all those things uh, before uh, uh, 1800 at uh, that time. And Ramon's professional activity in Calcutta between 1799 and 1802 was to loan money to civil servants, presumably um, in or near the college of Fort William. So most of the cases he asked loan from the man for civil sub servant. And instead of that, he tried to. Uh, teach them some Indian language, Indian things, uh, and other uh, things. His civil servant, uh, service employer, John Digby, was among the early, earliest college of Fort William students. And Ramon acquired his knowledge of the English language for, from Digby, who presumably provided him with his first window to the world. So, Ram Mohan Rai also uh, came to know the English language very well from the Digby and Digby uh, helped him to understand the ways properly and this is the new uh, uh, window open and new avenue open for uh, Ram Mohan Rai at that time and after Ram Mohan settled in Calcutta and published his translation of the Vedanta in 1815 he committed himself to a view of Indian culture that he would defend in private and public debate until his death in 1833. So he first translated Vedanta and he spent much time and effort resisting Christian missionaries such as John Clark Marshman on the one hand and fought a long struggle with fellow Bengalis in his effort to reform Hinduism of its contemporary abuses. So uh, he both way 
they tried to uh, made, a, uh, made a resistance uh, 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 when the Christian missionary started to uh, uh, vigorously and aggressively uh, convert the Hindu people and also the, uh, the Hindu pundits, he also against the Hindu pundits also. In the abridgment of the Vedant, Ramon argued that uh, that image worship as then practiced in India was an uh, aberration uh, from the authentic monotheist, monotheist tradition worship of the true and eternal God left no room for idolatry. So uh, if found that the mono, monotheist uh, 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 religion and Hindu religion wasn't not that much differences. So whether his knowledge of Islam influenced him in his rega regard, we do not know. We do know that in the manner of Orientalists such as William Jones and H.T. Kulbrook, Roy divided Indian history into two, into a Vedantic period that was the authentic model for the whole body of Hindu theology, law and literature. Uh, so we found that Roy divided Indian history into a Vedanta period. So and later period of Hindu idolatry with the innumerable gods, goddesses and temples which have since been destroying the texture of society. Misguided Brahmans uh, in their priestly function preferred to conceal the wisdom of the Vedanta within the dark curtain of the Sanskrit language, argued Ramohan, rather than transmit the truth to the people in their own vernacular language. So uh, uh, he was very, very aware of these things, Ramohan, that he was totally against to use the Sanskrit language to uh, to practice the uh, 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 the Vedanta uh, because he, he uh, most of the cases the Bengali people and the uh, the local people uh, does uh, doesn't understand uh, the words the meaning of Sanskrit and other things so that's why he always asks to uh, uh, translate all those things in in colloquial language. For this reason, he had himself translated the Vedanta and other classical sources into Bengali. Ramohan stressed again, again and again that in the Hindu Middle Ages, the wisdom of classical literature and philosophy vanished as society embraced the absurd, absurdity of an idolatrous religion. In a book on the Upanishad that Ramohan brought out in 1816, he argued that the true Indian faith was no different than the true Christianity and Islam in that all three had developed a notion of the unity of the supreme being as the sole soul ruler of the universe. As a proponent of Renaissance and modernity, it was not merely religious reform which Ramon advocated, but social reform as well in the name of religion. His eloquent defense of the Vedas in 1817 is a striking case in point of his attitude. He maintained that there was nothing in the scripture for example, to authorize Shoti or the burning of widows and yet widows were being immolated. He wrote against dowry, Shoti and Kulinism. Kulinism means you can take it as elitism. So secularism, the fourth aspect of the Bengal Renaissance was the least influenced by British Orientalism and it appealed to the segment of the intelligentsia who shout the true Hinduism in remote age of gold. The so-called Young Bengal movement made up of a 
coterie of students at Hindu college. So this young Bengal movement is the another huge impact to happen the Bengal Renaissance and rejected the idea of seeking answer to India's decadence in the historic dimension instead of advocating cultural changes by looking to the future. So they, were the, they became a big advocate uh, to, uh, to acknowledge the British contribution in the education and language sector. And uh, they asked the India to look forward and to look in a future way. Originally nurtured by, uh, uh, by Henry D. Rosario, a teacher at the college. And this teacher was the very influential character uh, for young girls. And he was the <coughs> English literature uh, uh, teacher. And during his brief but influential tenure between 1828 and 1831, young Bengal embedded the secular progressive spirit of the contemporary West, which they interpreted as entirely future oriented. D. Rosario, a Euro Asian, especially D. Rosario, born and brought up in India and his father was Portuguese and shared with Ramon Rai an advocacy of popular sovereignty for all nations of the world, but was far more westernized in his religious skepticism and unyielding rational speed. On the other hand, D, because D. Rosario that time very much inspired by the uh, enlightenment and secularism, and also his position was very reasoning based. So that's why he was very scientific and cause and effect based. So he was not that much aligned with the religion. And that's why Ramon Rai's advocacy and other things, he was not fond of with Ramon Rai's position and other things. And on D. Rosario shared with the Orientalist and Ramon a faith in the 18th century ideal of universality, whether it is William Jones linking Europe and Asia through a common linguistic source, the Indo-European language or the Serampur missionaries de-westernizing their reformation model to accommodate Asians or Ramon arguing for the universality of monotheism his position rested on a common cosmopolitan base. So when we found that the Europe started, uh, especially the British started to make our language, uh, our, yeah, our, our uh, education system is so much British, so much uh, that type of, but uh, uh, in the same time, Serampur missionary, especially the Protestant group was very much active de-Westernization the process. That's why uh, Kerry was very much aware and he published the Bangla uh, grammar book. And D. Rosario, who died a victim of cholera at 22. So uh, what I will uh, talk to you tomorrow that, that the another ep uh, epidemic, uh, huge epidemic will happen in 19th century and which is called cholera. And D. Rosario also died in cholera at 22 after uh, a brief period of misery, literary activity has left nothing to suggest Byronic cynicism or post Napoleon nationalism. In a state, he held steadfastly to his faith in the 18th century concept of human perfectibility, his legacy to his students, which became their contribution to the Bengal Renaissance and was his conviction that the way to revitalize India was not to re reverse ideals and values long gone, but to open Indian minds to the cultural offering of the West so that India might join in the race for a hopeful future.
hopefully guys you can hear me i i didn't find any sound so i don't know are you hearing or not okay i i, I reached my last slide and by the middle of the 19th century calcutta was asia's most notorious repository for diverse source of knowledge both ancient and modern from all corners of the world so even in today's dhaka and our literature also we found that much influence and uh, till then we found so many bengali writers who are very much influential in uh, in bangladesh also in this renaissance atmosphere uh, charts journals and newspapers held produce a feeling of cultural identity among the intelligentsia through the transmission of cultural attitudes alongside the intellectual aspect of the renaissance there developed a social identity and solidarity among professionals who had emerged largely as a result of close european contact special training and european style occupational status the new bengali elite who stirred a library in every home and an ardent record of patronage of printed works so from the bengal renaissance we found and we started to found and still date in dhaka the elite class we found that every elite class people they have their own library and other things and it's also uh, uh, the expression of elitism uh, till date so book stores had mul multiplied throughout calcutta and education had became a shout after commodity so even the, uh, these days if you have chance to visit calcutta and please try to visit college street and there you will find that there are 100 years old near about 200 years old uh, 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 bookshops you will find there uh, and which is still operating in same manner the socio intellectual avid adventure would not be confined to calcutta or to bengal but culture would spread to other metropolitan center with different linguistics and cultural backgrounds such as bombay and madras so today's bombay madras their intelligentsia and other things we found uh, because of the calcutta and 19th century calcutta's attitude and other things and till then we found that the calcutta's movie calcutta's uh, uh, west bengal's movie literature is very much different than the other uh, other states movie and others because uh, everywhere you find something which is uh, always provoked you or bound you to think something else uh, and which you won't found in uh, find in other uh, languages that much so presently most of the things are are waved from the calcutta so thank you for your kind passion